Chemistry Chapter 15 Lesson Video Part 4 and we're going to cover our last section 15.7 which is one of my favorites, Le Chatelier's Principle. So, Le Chatelier's Principle states that if a system at equilibrium is disturbed, then the system will shift to counteract the disturbance. So if it's at equilibrium and we mess something up, then it's going to try to fix that mess up. Disturbances include things like a change in concentration, we can increase or decrease, a change in pressure, again we can increase or decrease, a change in temperature, I don't know why I keep saying this, but we could increase or decrease, and the addition of a catalyst. Okay, so those are ways that we can disturb something at equilibrium. And so what we're going to look at is how do you know what happens then? How does it fix it? What does that even mean? So if the concentration of a reactant or product is increased, then the equilibrium shifts to consume the excess substance. So like if I have a reactant and I increase it, so now it's messed up, it's too much, it's going to shift to the product to consume that extra reactant. However, on the other hand, if I increase an amount of product, it wants to get rid of it, so it's going to shift to the reactants to consume that product. So if the concentration of a reactant or product decreases, then the equilibrium shifts to make more. So let's say I take away some NO. Well, then it wants to make more. So it's going to shift to the reactants and make more NO. Or if I take away some of my product, then it'll shift to the products to make more. All right, so that's what happens with concentration. Keep in mind, too, though, sometimes you can change concentration by adding water. Okay, it just depends on what the reaction is, but you'll see some of that later. All right, so what happens with pressure and volume? Well, obviously, first of all, this only affects gases. So if the volume decreases or pressure increases, those are the same type of change, then the equilibrium shifts to the side with the lowest number of moles of gases. So if I increase pressure or decrease volume, we want the lowest amount of moles of gases so that there's enough room for them all to be in there. On the other hand, if the volume increases or pressure decreases, it will shift to the side with the highest number of moles of gases. So y'all, you have to be careful. The number of solids, liquids, and aqueous doesn't matter. Those don't change a lot with volume and pressure changes like a gas would. So you're only focusing on gases with volume and pressure changes. All right? Sometimes they'll talk about changing pressure by adding an inert gas instead of changing the volume. So the pressure can also be increased by adding an inert gas that is not involved in the reaction. Like a lot of times it's a noble gas. Or sometimes it'll be nitrogen because you know N2 is very stable. Um, but like it'll, they'll add argon or helium or something like that. Since the inert gas will not change the partial pressures of the gases, there is no shift in equilibrium. And see that's hard because you want to think like, oh, well, if you increase pressure, it's going to shift to the side with the lower moles of gas. Like when we talked about the pressure and the volume. But if pressure is changed by the addition of an inert gas, it doesn't actually change partial pressure. So there is no shift in equilibrium. All right, so what's going on with temperature? Well, when there is a change in temperature, the delta H must be taken into account. So you got to look at delta H. Is it positive or negative? If delta H is positive, that means the reaction is endothermic. And you can consider heat a reactant. See how if you can figure out if heat is considered a reactant or a product, then you can use the same um, method of figuring out what the shift is with concentration. So let's say we have A yields B and heat is a reactant. If I increase heat, it's going to shift to B to get rid of heat. If I decrease heat, it's going to shift to A to make more heat. On the other hand, though, if delta H is negative, the reaction is exothermic, and heat is considered a product. So in this case, if I increase heat, it's going to shift to A to get rid of heat. If I decrease heat, it's going to shift to B to make more heat. Okay, so that's where it becomes important to know if it's exothermic or endothermic. All right, once heat is considered a reactant or product, then we can follow the rules of a change in concentration. If heat is added, the reaction shifts to reduce the heat. If heat is released, the reaction shifts to produce more heat. So let's look at some together, and then I'll let you try the next ones. So it says, in which direction will equilibrium shift when these things happen? Okay, so it gave me a reaction, it gave me a positive delta H, 
Once I see delta H is positive, I know I'm going to consider heat a reactant. So it says N2O4 is added. So if I add N2O4, now I have too much. So it's going to shift to the products to get rid of that extra N2O4. So when we say it shifts, we'll say it shifts to the right. Just like that. All right, the next one, it says N2, NO2 is removed. So if I take away NO2, if I decrease that amount, it wants to make more. So again, it's going to shift to the right. All right, part C, it says the total pressure is increased, but by the addition of N2. Remember, changing pressure with volume and changing pressure with an inert gas are two different things. Remember, there is no shift if you change pressure with an inert gas because it doesn't actually change the partial pressure. Okay, so for that one, there's no shift. But see, a lot of you, you would want to say it shifts this way because there's less moles of gas on that side. All right? Next, it says the volume is increased. Okay, so volume increasing means I have more room for more particles. So if I want more particles, I would want to shift this direction because, of course, this is only one and this is two. And by the way, y'all, just to let you know, I probably should put that on here. These are both gases. All right, so it's going to shift to the right. Gosh, it's like all of them are shifting to the right. Maybe part E shifts to the left. All right, so our last one is a temperature one. So it says the temperature is decreased. So remember, heat is considered a reactant, so if I decrease temperature, it's going to want to create more heat. So it is going to shift to the left. Okay, so like I said, y'all, if you take away something, it wants to make more. If you add something, it wants to get rid of it. Like, that's pretty much what's happening. If you're talking about volume and pressure, more particles want more volume. Less particles want less volume. And if you're talking about changing pressure with an inert gas, nothing happens. Another time that nothing happens is if you add a catalyst. It'll reach equilibrium faster, but it doesn't actually change anything. All right, so y'all tried this, I'll assume you already paused it, tried it, and let's look at it together. So it says in which, so we have delta H is positive again. So that means heat is considered a reactant. All right, so it says uh, which way will equilibrium shift if Cl2 is removed? So if I decrease my Cl2, it's going to want to make more, so it's going to go to the right. All right, next one says if temperature is decreased. Well, if I decrease my heat, it's going to want to make more, and so it's going to shift to the left. All right, so hopefully you're doing okay so far. Next, it says the volume of the reaction system is increased. Again here, probably should have told you these are all gases. All right, I have more volume, so that means room for more particles. Over here, I only have one mole of gas. On this side, I have two moles of gas. So more room would want to make more moles of gas. So it will also shift to the right. And then last one. So it says we are going to add PCL3. So if we add PCL3, it wants to get rid of it. So it will shift to the left. All right, so hopefully you did okay with that one. Many, many times, once you get Le Chatelier's principle, it's like, oh, okay, that's pretty easy. So hopefully that was you. <laughs> if you haven't got it yet, hopefully you will soon. All right, so next we're going to go back to uh, delta H. Okay, we've done delta H before with our bond enthalpies. Okay, and so it's always your uh, products minus your reactants. And of course, remember, this is just a summation. So we add the products and we subtract the reactants. So in the first one, it tells me to pull the numbers from Appendix C. So what I did was I just put them right here. However, remember, sometimes they won't give you these because you have to know delta H for an element its natural state is zero. All right, so it says determine how the equilibrium constant, oh, sorry. First, it says determine the standard enthalpy change for the reaction. So i got to determine delta H. So remember, delta H is just products minus reactants. So let me start with my products. So this is negative 46.19 kilojoules per mole. I have two moles, okay, so that means I need to multiply that number by two. So when I plugged in for that one, 
I did this times 2, you got negative 92.35 kilojoules. All right, and then I minus my reactants. Okay, so I had 0 for uh, the N2, and I had 0 technically times 3, I mean, you know, which is still just 0 for my H2. And so once I did that, obviously I got negative 92.35 kilojoules. All right, so my delta H is negative 92.35, and then we just change it to kilojoules per mole of reaction. That's what you'll see a lot of times. So since my delta H is negative, heat is considered a product this time. All right, so then part B says determine how the equilibrium constant for this reaction should change with temperature. Okay, so if I increase heat, then it's going to want to get rid of the heat, so it's going to go in this direction and make more reactants. Remember, K is products over reactants, so if I make more reactants, K is going to decrease. Okay, so I have a much better, like, nicely worded answer that's going to come up, but just in a nutshell, since delta H is negative, it's exothermic, if you increase heat, it's going to favor the reactants, more reactants means that K is going to decrease. Okay, so here I'll click to show you like my nicely worded answer. I don't want to write all this up here because it'll take forever. This, this video is going to be long enough. Okay, so we got negative delta H, so an increase in temperature would cause K to decrease. Because remember, if heat is a product, it's going to cause a shift to reactants. And reactants is on bottom of the K. Alright, so y'all try this one. I already put the numbers up here for uh, from Appendix C. Just don't forget, these are the numbers without multiplying by any of the coefficients. All right, so I'll assume you've tried this already, and let's look at it together. So, of course, delta H is just products minus reactants. So, I take one of my products, so it's negative 288.07, but I multiplied it by 2. And so, for that one, I got negative 576.14 kilojoules. All right, then I do my O2, but of course, it's just 0 minus my negative 542.2, but I'm going to multiply that by 2. So minus negative 1,084.4 kilojoules. So that ends up giving me 508.26 kilojoules per mole reaction. All right, so this time my delta H is positive, so that means heat would be considered a reactant. So it says use the result to determine how the equilibrium constant for the reaction should change with temperature. So if I increase temperature, it's going to favor products. Well, since K is products of reactants, if I increase products, K would increase. Just like that. Okay, because we talked about how K can change with temperature. Remember, K does not change based on initial amounts or anything like that, but it does change with temperature. So here I said delta H is, of course, the 508.26, so an increase in temperature will cause K to increase. All right, so what's going on with this catalyst thing? So the addition of a catalyst does change the mechanism, like we learned in Chapter 14, to lower activation energy, so which we learned in Chapter 14, to speed up the rate of the reaction. But y'all, the rate of the reaction doesn't have anything to do with your K value. Okay. This activation energy is lowered for both the forward and the reverse reaction. So that's why equilibrium is not affected by a catalyst. It will get you to equilibrium faster, but it's not going to change anything else about equilibrium. All right, since the activation energy for both processes is lowered by the same amount, the catalyst will increase the rate at which equilibrium is achieved, but it will not cause a shift. So if they ask you, like, oh, well, what, is it going to shift to the left or right if you add a catalyst? Neither. It doesn't affect the shifting of equilibrium. It just gets you there faster. All right, sample integrative exercise. Oh man, I'm trying to trying to beat them coming on announcements. So let's let's hurry. So at temperatures near 800 degrees Celsius, steam is passed over hot coke, a form of carbon, and reacts to form carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas. The mixture of gases that results is an important industrial fuel called water gas. Okay, so we have solid carbon, gaseous water, making gaseous carbon monoxide, and hydrogen gas. So it says, at 800 degrees Celsius, the equilibrium constant for the reaction is 14.1. What are the equilibrium partial pressures for water, CO, and H2? 
in the equilibrium mixture at this temperature if we start with solid carbon and 0.1 moles of H2O in a one liter reaction vessel. So automatically I can see, whoa, whoa, they gave me moles, but it's in one liter. So I know this is really 0.1 molarity, um, H2O. Okay, so let's start with our reaction because I've already clicked. Sorry, I'm writing quickly. I hope I don't start making mistakes. When I start rushing, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, so this is a solid, so we don't care about it. We don't fill anything in. It told me I'm starting with a 0.1 molar gas, but here's the problem. They gave me Kp. They didn't give me Kc. That means I need a pressure. I don't need a molarity. Okay, so I can see I know moles, I know volume, I know temperature, so I should start thinking heat equals NRT. Okay, and so I need a pressure. So that means P equals NRT divided by V. So let's solve for that real quick. I might have to erase this part way through also. So my N is 0.1 moles. My R is, did I go to ATM? Yep, I went to ATM, so 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. My temperature is, oh, where is it? 800 degrees Celsius, but of course I have to add 273. So that becomes 1073 Kelvin. And then divided by my volume of one liter. So my moles cancel, my Kelvin cancels, my liters cancel, I'm left with ATM and I got 8.81 ATM. All right, so that's what I can put in right here. So see, this one was tricky because they started out giving you moles, which we could have easily gotten a molarity, but then we didn't even need that. All right, it didn't tell me anything about products, so I'm gonna start with zero for both of those. So on this side, I'm gonna subtract X to get 8.81 minus X, and this one I'm gonna plus X and plus X. So I'm gonna get X and X. Alright, so I'm going to erase this. This was just how I figured out the partial pressure to plug in for water. Alright, so let's keep on going. I may have to erase multiple times on this because there's, there's a lot going on. Oh gosh, yeah, because we got to go full quadratic equation again because of course they freaking gave us a big K value. Oh, I can't wait till we get past that. Alright, so then I set up my K value. So Kp, of course, is the pressure of CO. Whoop, I don't know why I made that big times the pressure of H2 over the pressure of just the H2O. So notice I did not use carbon because it's a solid. All right, so I know that Kp is 14 point, oh here, I'm getting more room. It's 14.1, so my PCO is X, my H2 is X, my H2O is 8.81 minus X. All right, so um, I'm just gonna go ahead and all the way arrange this to where we're solving for zero. So once I did that, I ended up getting that x squared is 14.1, x squared plus 14.1x minus 124.221 equals zero. Okay, so my a is one, my b is 14.1, and my c is this negative number. All right, I'm gonna save time from writing all of it, I got two values for x, like I plugged it into the quadratic equation. I don't want to do it again, mainly because it's long. Second, they're about to come on with announcements. And third, it's never on the AP exam anyway. So for two x values, when I added, I got 6.14. When I subtracted, I got negative 20.24. Well, y'all, since two of them are x, the negative 20.24 cannot be an option. So it has to be 6.14. So once I know that, I can just do 8.81 minus x, which is the 6.14, uh, and so I got 2.76 atm for water, and then both of these are just x, so it's 6.14 atm for CO and 6.14 atm for H2. Okay, so like I said, y'all, you should not have to actually do any kind of quadratic equation on the real AP exam. It's just too time consuming. All right, so we are going to need this 6.14 change on the next part, so just keep that in mind, okay? But let's keep on going, because like I said, oh my gosh, please don't have announcements. Okay, so moving on. 
It says, what is the minimum amount of carbon required to achieve equilibrium under these conditions? So we decided that the change, of course, was that 6.14 ATM. Okay, so that means if I'm trying to figure out carbon, I'm going to have to do moles because I need to be able to do a mole ratio. So how can I do moles if I have pressure? I can use PV equals NRT. So N, of course, is PV over RT. So my pressure, we decided, was 6.14 ATM. My volume, it told me, was 1 liter. My R is 0 0.0821 liters times ATM over moles times Kelvin. And my temperature is, whoa, what was it? Oh, it was 800 degrees Celsius, which is 1,073 Kelvin. So ATM, liters, Kelvin cancels. And so I got 0 0.07 moles of H2O. Okay, so that was the amount of H2O that actually reacts. So once I know that, I can use my stoichiometry. So one mole of H2O is one mole of carbon. Y'all, I just pulled that from the reaction. Okay, like just to show you. One mole of carbon is one mole of H2O. And so then, of course, that means it's 0 0.07 moles of carbon that I would have to have present in order to achieve equilibrium. All right, then it says, what is the total pressure in the vessel at equilibrium? Well, y'all, I had my three amounts that we just calculated in part A, so all I would do was add those. So the pressure total is the pressure of the um, water, which was 2.67, plus the pressure of the CO, which was 6.14, plus the pressure of the H2, which was also 6.14. So y'all, all I'm pulling these numbers from is part A. Okay, I'm adding them to together and I got 14.95 ATM total pressure, just like that. All right, so whew, let's keep going. Oh man, I think there's only two more parts. Oh, please don't come on with buses. All right, so at 25 degrees Celsius, the value of Kp for this reaction is 1.7 times 10 to the negative 21. Is the reaction exothermic or endothermic? So y'all, they told me that Kp was 14.1 at 800 degrees Celsius. And then at 25 degrees Celsius, it's super, super tiny. So that means the reaction is favored at higher temperatures. So in that case, the reaction is endothermic. Okay, because if the reaction favors higher temperatures, what that means is heat must be a reactant because as I increase it, it would favor the products which is why K gets bigger at a higher temperature. All right, and then last one. Sorry I'm rushing, but oh gosh. All right, to produce the maximum amount of CO and H2 at equilibrium, should the pressure be increased or decreased? Okay, so I'm gonna click back so we can see the reaction real fast. So we're looking, should we increase or decrease if we want a lot of products? Okay, so this is two moles of gas. This, is only one mole of gas. Okay, so if I want to make more products, I need more room for more moles of gas. So I either want to increase volume, and that wasn't my option, or decrease pressure. And so that's my option. So for that last one, we would want to decrease pressure. Okay, so chapter, uh, First chapter of Equilibrium Down, hopefully it didn't scare you off. Um, not gonna lie, some of it gets a little harder as we go into chapter 16 and 17. Yeah, you got this. Remember, K is products over reactants. Look at what shifts for Le Chatelier's principle and things like that. And as long as you can keep those conceptual topics in your mind, the math does not usually get as hard as what I'm going over in this on the AP exam. All right, but y'all, you got this.